Well, thank you, and I want to thank the planners of this forum for Janet and her colleagues for inviting me to present. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the American Association of Colleges of Nursing, we represent the baccalaureate and graduate schools of nursing. We have over 670 member institutions so that we provide resources for all of the constituents within the uh, schools of nursing and programs the faculty, the administrative staff, the deans, the leadership on down the line. And we look at curricular issues, set standards for curriculum, and provide a lot of faculty development and also data collection. We also have an autonomous accrediting arm, the Commission on Collegiate Nursing Education, and we have a certification arm, uh, the Commission on Nurse Educa uh, Certification, which uh, cert currently certifies uh, clinical nurse leaders who are new masters prepared nurses with a focus on quality improvement and patient safety. Um, I think you've gotten the idea that all of us up here could spend a lot of time talking and I have a lot of things that I could say but hopefully I will be able to um, at least present some ideas and some thoughts as you work through later today and tomorrow with where you want to go. Um, and I think the biggest message that I want to deliver is that you need to look at opportunities and to begin to think very differently. Um, as Dr. McCarthy said, when we met initially and we asked what we were supposed to focus on, she said, well, you can be the, you know, the ghost of the past and you can be the ghost of the, the present and you can be the ghost of the future. So I took it to heart. So I am the ghost of nursing <laughs> education present. That was my assignment. I was also asked to really reflect a little bit on the IOM, the recent report on the future of nursing and what the impact is and what are the implications then uh, for nursing education and I've turned this around a little bit and focused in and then also to look at uh, what the opportunities are and what's going on in nursing education. As you all know and hopefully uh, you've probably all slept on this report, there are four key messages in the IOM future of nursing. I think everywhere I've been there's been a presentation on the future of nursing at every conference in the last X number of months um, and every group is focusing on it. And I think that is critically important because that the message is then that that's where the opportunities are right now and to really work with our colleagues to advance nursing education. The four key messages are here. I'm sure you've read them. Um, I've selected a few of the specific recommendations and targeted guidelines for the report that I think have a clear message for what we are doing here today and tomorrow. And so I've also changed the impact on nursing education to improve care of children and families and tried to look at that perspective. Obviously, one of the most important uh, recommendations is to increase the proportion of RNs with a baccalaureate degree to 80% by the year 2020. That is a significant challenge for all of us in education and practice. And I say that together because I think we need to do that as partners in education and practice. We can't do that alone in education. We need to double the number of nurses with a doctorate. Oops, that's a typo there. It shouldn't be not be 2010. Uh, but we need to double the number. That was wishful thinking, I think. <laughs> we need to double the number of nurses with a doctorate. And that includes both those with a research focus and a practice doctorate focus. We need to ensure that nurses engage in lifelong learning. We heard that this morning, that we can't just prepare nurses and graduate them from our education programs and assume that then they're done for life and that they can go out and practice. This is a lifelong engagement, particularly with the rapid change in the information that's coming out with the complexity with our, of our systems, the changes in practice looking at just you know some of the things that came up today, the genetics, the use of technology, uh, communication. And then we need to prepare nurses to lead change to advance health. So we're talking about preparing leaders and not just leaders in the administrative sense but leaders all the way up from our baccalaureate graduates to our master's graduates on up to our doctoral level graduates. One of the other recommendations that I've pulled out from the report is the need to implement nurse residency programs. And they're focusing, they talk about residency programs after pre licensure programs or after preparation entry for advanced practice nursing programs. And also when you're talking about transitioning 
into new clinical practice areas. This is directly out of the IOM report. So I don't think I need to belabor the message, but that you can see that there are implications for the work and for the conversation that we're doing here today. One of the things that I wanted to do when I was asked to look at this from the present, and that is um, you've talked a lot about and compared it, and I know that Mary Ann talked about her goal for the future of nursing was to have, for pediatric nursing, was to have um, a center of excellence or a pediatric nursing center. I do want to clarify one thing you said, and just to be clear, it is the John A. Hartford Foundation, which is located in New York City, is really the benefactor, has been the one that has provided so many millions of dollars in funding to move, to enhance the nursing preparation to care for older adults. And it is the Hartford Institute, was, it, which is located at NYU College of Nursing, was one of the earliest uh, recipients of that and created this center or institute at NYU. And their focus was on education, practice, policy, and research. Out of that, though, there has grown a number of other grant opportunities focused on curricular development, both at the undergraduate and graduate levels. Uh, the, but what we've learned, and I'm hoping to provide you with some kind of insights into this whole development, is where I think you can get your biggest bang for your buck and do some things that are not necessarily costly, but we've learned lessons from what we've done. Uh, so when we talk about where I think that um, you ought to look at some of your strategies. But I put this up here for a reason, and I want to compare the survey that you just heard the results for, which are what you have on the left, that uh, Janet talked about today, looking at faculty. And that survey, I realize we're comparing, you know, one kind of apple with another, but I do think we're comparing apples and apples because the technique was similar. In 2003, the Hartford Institute did a curricular sur curriculum survey of undergraduate programs. And actually, this was uh, the second survey. They did their original survey, which would actually compare to your survey for 2011 in 1999. So we're looking at a survey that was done after four years of work of trying to integrate uh, care of older adults into the curriculum and a lot of money put in. Um, we heard this morning, and I pulled out the, the data from the survey, the preliminary results, that there's a mean of three faculty teaching in an undergraduate program with a graduate degree in pediatrics. 83% said the undergraduate program did an excellent or good job preparing graduates to provide care to children, and 49% said had a pediatric standalone course, and 20% said they had a standalone course and integrated the content. In the Hartford Institute curriculum survey in 2003, less than one-third of the schools said they had any gerontology certified faculty. Only 76% of schools have at least one expert in gero on their full-time faculty. And 34% of the baccalaureate programs had a standalone gero course. And 92% had integrated the gero specific content. That was at 63% in 1997 when they first did the survey. So let me also uh, just compare, and I'm not trying to rain on your parade, but I'll get to the message of what I hopefully will uh, impart here. In your survey that you did, you looked at competition for clinical practice sites that was significant or moderate barrier was at 75%. And insufficient number of full-time qualified faculty were 33% saw it as a moderate or significant barrier. And I think those are important numbers. But I want you to compare it, not take that out of context, but compare it. In our 2010-2011 enrollment and graduation report, we do an annual report of all the uh, baccalaureate and graduate schools every year. And our data from last fall, the number one reasons for not accepting all qualified applicants in generic baccalaureate programs, 62% said there was insufficient number of faculty, and 65% said there was insufficient clinical sites. So you can see that, unfortunately, the responses in pediatrics and care of children were really talking about pr problems that permeate all undergraduate and nursing education. So not that you don't have an issue to deal with, but, you know, you're not all alone. 
Um, and you can't really see this, but I think hopefully I will get you to think more positively, not th that your glass is half empty, but that your glass is half full, and maybe it's not full enough, and you work, need to fill it up, but you're really not, it's not empty. So, what are the opportunities? And this is where I need you to start thinking, being thinking outside the box, think creatively, and think about what can be. And where can you integrate this into the curriculum? Opportunities, opportunities, opportunities. I know at one point I was talking to Janet about where funding opportunities might be. But not just funding, but looking at where you can market this and how you can convince individuals that this is something that needs to be focused on. And I just off the top of my head wrote down some of the major national initiatives that are ongoing. I guarantee those of you who are really focused on kids all the time could make this a much longer list. But if you just look at the national news, uh, Michelle Obama's campaign, Let's Move, uh, the concussions and sports injuries and the focus on you know, kids with those, uh, the national health, transportation and safety, highway sa transportation and safety, um, keeping our kids safe. So what I have done is for, um, AACN, I mentioned that we have focused on establishing guidelines for education at all levels. And I've just put up here so you have a reference to what I'm talking about. That the, we call them our essential series, our essentials for nursing education. So that the essentials of baccalaureate education for professional nursing practice, the essentials of master's education and on down. Uh, the essentials of doctoral education for advanced nursing practice provide the foundation and the expected outcomes of graduates at the end of these programs. They're not specific uh, course objectives, content, uh, telling uh, faculty how to design their program, but rather the expectations for individuals at the end of their program, for somebody coming out of their baccalaureate program. These are national consensus-based documents. They are developed, uh, taken across the country with input from both practice and education on what is expected of somebody. So our baccalaureate essentials was approved by our membership in 2008. So they're all relatively new uh, documents reflecting current practice, although as much as you can reflect current practice from yesterday to today. Uh, the research-focused doctoral programs, just so you know, we don't establish essentials for those, but we ha do have a document called Pathways to Excellence that really talk about what should be the expectations, what criteria, what resources, what should faculty look like, what should postdoctoral programs look like for those programs. So the essentials of baccalaureate education really provides the foundation for all types of baccalaureate nursing programs. The generic or traditional uh, nursing baccalaureate program, the RN to BSN, the ent and the entry level MSN program, which many individuals call generic masters or second degree masters. So we're really talking about all these graduates. So when you're looking to implement or make changes in outcomes, you need to look at all types of programs, but this foundational document really provides that and is where to start. So, building the case. I've pulled a couple statements out of our current baccalaureate essentials document so that you can see that there is an emphasis and there is the case for including content related to the care of children and families embedded within the document to make your case. And these are a couple of statements that I've pulled out. And when I was asked a little while ago um, what my concern was or did I have it, what was my greatest concern for cre preparing individuals, well, what was my greatest concern regarding pediatric nursing in the future? And I said, my greatest concern is not so much with pediatric nursing, but rather the changing demographics of our population, which points to two of the, just two of these statistics that I have at the bottom, and the need to prepare all nurses to provide care for this changing demographics in our population. Same issue with looking at the care of older adults in the case that we've made. 
for preparing nurses. And I think that Marianne made an excellent point that when you're talking about preparing baccalaureate graduates, you're not talking about specialists, you're talking about preparing individuals to nurses and where they're gonna be seeing, who they're gonna be seeing and where they're gonna be providing care. So, I am not gonna belabor the point, but I went through each of the essential areas and I think there's nine. I get my different documents mixed up. There's either eight or nine essential areas. To them. I, you know, I live, you know, I should have them memorized, but each document is a little bit different. But the major essential area, the first one, is liberal education for baccalaureate generalist nursing practice. And so I went through and I looked at the outcomes and I looked at and thought about where content and where it should be integrated. So that as you look at the curriculum, I would encourage you to think not just about those last two years or however many years of the nursing courses, but think where are individuals going through those programs getting content related that they can build on that will impact their practice. And some of the areas I've listed here. Uh, in just brainstorming off the top of my head about where you could in insert or build on content and other courses, coursework and content. The second one is basic organizational and systems <laughs> leadership for quality care and patient safety. Look at what the content, the, some of the areas and the outcomes relate to quality improvement, patient safety, identifying risks, safe practices, evidence-based practice. Scholarship for evidence-based practice, we're looking at translating evidence into practice, identifying practice gaps in care, safeguarding vulnerable populations, and it even talks about the very young being one of our most vulnerable populations. And we've already heard about looking at nurse sensitive indicators this morning. Information management and patient care technology, safe use of new technology in the care of children. I think our school-based nursing uh, representative talked about use of technology in schools and the need to work with integrating that with, in with other healthcare systems and their technology. Healthcare policy, finance, and regulatory environments is the fifth essential area. Think about the policy, social justice, that talks about under this area, policies that impact kids. Healthcare inequities, and advocating for kids and their families. Interprofessional communication and collaboration, caring for kids and their families in teams. Team care and interprofessional practice is extremely important, is on the forefront now. So who should be members of teams and, how, and what areas of care? Roles of nursing and other professionals and communicating with families and other members of the healthcare team. Clinical prevention and population health. This is a huge area. This morning you, you talked about the lack of environmental health in the curriculum and genetics. These are concepts that are specifically listed under this essential area. Those are some of the newer areas. So when you think about strategies and resources, I would encourage you to think, and because I'm gonna propose a, uh, you know, a strategy, but when you're thinking about developing, whether they be case-based studies or learning resources, um, you know, faculty need help figuring out how they in integrate this into the curriculum. Cases, learning resources focused on environmental health or genetics. Professionalism and professional values is the eighth essential area. Some of the things under this area include impact of attitudes, values, and expectations on care why shouldn't, couldn't this be on care of the very young? Protect patient privacy and confidentiality. The issue with adolescents and their families providing care. Social justice, professional boundaries with patients and families. And then the ninth essential area is really integrating all this into one's practice, into a generalist nursing practice, and where are the opportunities to provide. And it specifically says to provide, prepared to provide care for patients across the lifespan from the very young to the older adult. To understand variations and how principles are applied in different kinds of settings. Okay. So, 
where are some of those opportunities for enhancing pediatrics or care of children and families in the baccalaureate curriculum? I would propose that we've learned from our experiences with other areas that one of the biggest needs is faculty development and providing learning resources for faculty and exemplars. So I would propose that you focus on helping faculty do this, faculty development and providing learning resources for faculty, whether that build on the current baccalaureate essentials, that helps faculty integrate pediatric focused content into the entry level curriculum, identify available resources, what's out there? Where are there other associations? You in the room could sit around and do this. Where do we have web-based resources? Are there modules that are developed? Are there case unfolding case studies? Are there simulation examples? Um, and if not, then that's where you begin to identify the gaps and develop these resources. Um, just off the top of my head, I was sitting at a couple meetings over the last week and I heard people talking about them. So I just happened to list some of the, the ones. You could add very many more to some of the places where there are already learning resources. But pulling them together in an electronic resource or center where somebody could go to it and talk about you know, what's available. And then providing faculty development to help them figure out how to use it, where they could in integrate it. Are there curricular exemplars for both clinical and didactic? Interactive web-based studies, podcasts. Uh, in, your, in your survey, only 32% said they were using interactive web-based case studies. Great opportunity. Podcasts, simulations. Uh, identify available screening tools and have links to them and, and maybe modules on how to use them or teach students that they can go and learn them how to use them to develop for cogn checking cognitive level or child abuse. And then a best or innovative practices for clinical experiences. And you've already talked about some of these. Where do we see kids? And where are most nurses going to be coming into contact with children? And how can we best impact then their health in the long run? We've talked about learning resources. Think about opportunities for on your campus. What other departments? Do you have an education department? Do you have an early development department? Do you have theology? Do you have business? Do you have law? Think about interdisciplinary experiences with those. Service learning opportunities and or even sharing courses. And I hear again, faculty development, webinars, pre-conference sessions, sessions at major conferences. Somebody mentioned NCLEX. One of the strategies that the gerontology folks did, and it takes a lot of work and a lot of discussion, and that is working with N uh, NCSBN, and it took several years to do this, is to talk them into crosswalking the NCLEX and identify questions and content areas, and not just where they use a kid that's 12 years old, but really focuses on pediatric content. Nominate item writers. And I wanted to make one comment about the post-baccalaureate residency program. AACN and UHC have a, a post-baccalaureate. It's a one-year post-baccalaureate residency program that has been developed. It's been evaluated extensively. There is extensive evaluation and outcome data with great data on the website here. There's a link here. Um, but the important thing is that they're between academic and practice partnerships. There is also now an accreditation process through CCNE to accredit these post-baccalaureate residencies. So I would offer to you that this is a great opportunity to look at where some of these residencies have been developed and think about how there might be something specific with some of your partners here from the national children, some of the children's hospitals of developing a partnership and developing an exemplar of a residency, but building on what's already been done and tested. And I thank you, and I am available at least today uh, for questions and answers and look forward to discussion.